Welcome to Exhumed, an underground retrospective of arts and culture in the late 20th century. I'm James Wallace. Tonight, we're going to look at the importance of two key British post-punk bands, Public Image Limited and Joy Division. The Sex Pistols' North American tour in early 1978 was extremely turbulent. The tour was designed to be controversial, as most of the dates were booked in the conservative American South by manager Malcolm McLaren, guaranteeing confrontations with the audience. Sid Vicious was spiraling downward into a pit of self-destruction, as he was seriously addicted to heroin, but was now in full withdrawal because he couldn't get access to the drug. Much of the audience showed up to see this walking disaster. Vicious would end up getting into fights with his own security team, audience members, and photographers. Steve Jones and Paul Cook had become completely disgusted with Vicious's behavior and felt singer Johnny Rotten's ego had become too big to handle. During the encore for the final show in San Francisco, Rotten stated that they were only going to do one encore because he was lazy and ended the song, a cover of No Fun by the Stooges, by asking the audience, Ever feel like you've been cheated? Good night, before storming off the stage. Vicious was taken to Los Angeles before setting up shop in New York with girlfriend Nancy Spungen. Jones and Cook went down to Brazil to do some recordings, and Rotten flew to New York, where he announced in the newspaper that the band had broken up. McLaren attempted to keep the band going with some recordings, but essentially Rotten's statement was true. Rotten was hard up financially, so he called Richard Branson, the head of Virgin Records, for a plane ticket back to London. Branson and photographer Dennis Morris convinced Rotten to fly to Kingston, Jamaica first, where Branson would try to sign new reggae artists to his label. Branson also flew the members of Devo to sign to the Island Nation as well in order to get Rotten to front the band. Neither the band nor Rotten were interested in the project. When he got back to London, Rotten decided to put together his own band and would no longer use the stage name Johnny Rotten, but instead his real name, John Lydon. He approached his friend John Warble, who was now going by the moniker Ja Wobble, about playing bass. Unlike Sid Vicious, the novice Wobble picked up the instrument fast and his style was influenced by dub reggae, a style of music that Lydon was also a big fan of. Lydon also asked Keith Levine to join as the guitarist. Levine had been a member of The Clash in the early days, and a member of an early punk band, Flowers of Romance, with Sid Vicious. More about that name later. Rounding up the lineup was Canadian drummer Jim Walker. Lydon wanted to create music that was very different f from the more straight-ahead punk rock of the Sex Pistols. He envisioned a kind of anti-rock music that took its cues from dub reggae and experimental music that had come out of Germany. The group would eventually settle on the name Public Image after the Muriel Sparks novel of the same name. Soon, the band declared itself Public Image Limited and would function as a kind of company or corporation. They were signed to Virgin Records and would release their debut single, Public Image, in September 1978. The single is an upbeat punk anthem where Lydon sings through a space echo dub style asking if they can hear hello, hello, before the pace of the band increases and Lydon states, you never listen to a word that I say. After the release of the single, the band realized that they had already spent a large chunk of their recording budget that they had been given to record an entire album with, which would be called Public Image First Issue. The track's theme, Religion, and Anacelia were recorded at Towns House Studios and The Manor Studio. To save further money, they went to Gooseberry Studios, which was a low-budget reggae studio, to record Low Life, Attack, and Fodder Stumpf. Lydon made a serious statement with this album. The three chord punk anthems were long gone. Throughout the album, Lydon sings, screams, wails, and rants. The throbbing bass of Ja Wobble and the dissonant guitar of Keith Levine create an interplay that sounds like a post apocalyptic reggae. Lydon showed this desire for experimentation by opening the album with the 
over a nine minute long theme, which is full of hard, simplistic drum beats, noisy guitar, and Leiden exercising his demons vocally. The track Religion One is a spoken word piece by Biden with Leiden with no instruments, where he lambasts the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church. The album ends with Fuderstumpf. To fill up the album as time was ticking away, they simply created a disco beat, put in synthesizers and a bass line, and then had Jawobble singing over and over, We Only Want to Be Loved. The track would eventually become popular with the Studio 54 crowd. With first issue, Lydon had created a dividing line between his current musical vision and his past in the Sex Pistols. It would be the follow-up album that would truly leave its mark on rock history. Jim Walker had left the band in February 1979, so they initially brought in David Humphrey free, but he ended up only recording the tracks Albatroth and Death Disco Swan Lake before leaving in May 1979. Levine would play drums on some tracks, as would drummers Richard Dudgonski and Martin Atkins. The album would be titled Metal Box and was recorded in the spring and summer of 1979 and was recorded in various studios. Gone were the short, catchy tracks that were found on the first album. Leiden would dive deeper into his vision of creating anti-rock rock music. The influence of the German band Can is fully evident and channeled through dub reggae grooves, avant-garde experiments, beef hearty and rhythms, and garage rock roughness. The album starts off with the 10 minute epic Albatross. Ja Wobble lays down the heavy bass groove while Levine scrapes out a kind of off kilter funk and Leiden improvises the lyrics. In Swan Song, Leiden wears his heart on his sleeve as he describes the emotional turmoil he's going through watching his mother die of cancer. The band play Noisy Dub in the background. The other highlights include the hypnotic pop tones, a song about a girl who gets kidnapped and put in the trunk of the car only later to identify her kidnappers by the tape of songs that they had played in the car. The, the Suit is a song where Leiden rants about working class people who wear suits to try and act middle class. And the instrumental track Socialist makes heavy use of electronics and keyboards. Leiden takes imp- inspiration from poet John Keats on No Birds Do Sing, and the album closes with Radio 4, an instrumental track where Leiden took over bass, Levine, sorry, took over bass duties and played string instrument sounds on a synthesizer. The original album consisted of three 12 inch records packed in a metal canister. After selling 60,000 copies, the format was discontinued, as listeners would constantly have to flip sides, and removing the records from the canister was difficult and often resulted in scratching. It was re-released as a double album entitled Second Edition. The band had created an uncompromising album that had a huge impact for decades to come, particularly on indie rock bands in the 90s. During the tour for this album, the band would often get into verbal confrontations with the audience members and promoters. They had an appearance on Dick Clark where they gave up trying to lip sync, and Lydon and Levine gave a particularly hostile interview with TV host Tom Schneider. In November 1980, they released the live album Paris O Pretemps, which was the last album to feature Ja Wobble. He was fired for using some unreleased pill material on his debut solo album, The Legend Lives On, Ja Wobble in Betrayal. At a gig in 1981, they had jazz drummer Sam Ulano play with the band unrehearsed while pill music played simultaneously out the speakers. This caused the audience to riot. With the follow-up album, Leiden chose to challenge the audience even further. Levine and Leiden, with the occasional help from Martin Atkins on drums, created a percussive experimental album. The sound is a mix of Leiden's wailing vocals, Levine's obsession with synthesizers and distorted drums. It is a dark cacophony of nihilistic angst. Levine plays a variety of instruments, including cello, guitar, bass, and drums, along with the ubiquitous synthesizer, while Leiden himself experiments with violin, saxophone, and percussion. This album exemplifies the anti-rock concept that was stated in the Pill Manifesto. The album made Kurt Cobain's top 50 favorite albums, and as he stated, 
It is totally uncompromising, but works somehow. Leiden would start to pursue a more commercial approach to Pills Sound, starting with This is What You Want, This Is What You Get, which definitely had more of a danceable sound. Another high point was 1986's album, produced by Bill Laswell, where Leiden would brought in numerous musicians, such as Bernie Worrell, Ginger Baker, Steve Vai, to make a unique alternative rock album. Leiden would again pursue a more commercial direction on 1987's Happy and 1989's Nine. Leiden still makes albums with Pill, and the band is extremely important, not only for their eccentric approach to music, but because it allowed Leiden to sever himself from the caricature that was Johnny Rotten, allowing the exemplifier of punk to distance himself from punk's restrictions is why Pill is arguably the most important post-punk band. Leiden's original band, the Sex Pistols, would inspire another pivotal post-punk band, Joy Division. At a Sex Pistols gig in 1976 at the Manchester Lesser Free Trade Hall, both Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook were in attendance. They began playing together under the name The Stiff Kittens. After placing an ad in a local newspaper, they were soon joined by drummer Steve Brotherdale and vocalist Ian Curtis. Sumner and Hook both knew Curtis, so they decided to hire him without an audition. Curtis was a voracious reader as a child and got a scholarship to Macclesfield's Independent King School at age of 11. Over the course of the next few years, Curtis would further devour literature and philosophy, including the works of poets Tom Gunn and T.S. Eliot, philosophers Frederick Nietzsche and Jean-Paul Sartre, and authors Fedor Dostoevsky, Franz Kafka, Herman Hesse, William S. Burroughs, and J.G. Ballard. As a teenager, he volunteered to visit lonely elderly people in their homes where he would steal any prescription drugs he could find. Unfortunately, he would end up taking a large amount of the drug Largosil and overdose, forcing his father to take him to the hospital to have his stomach pumped. He also developed an admiration for both David Bowie and Jim Morrison, singers who would influence his melancholy vocal style. Curtis eventually gave up his studies and decided to get a job in the civil service. When Curtis joined the band, the name became Warsaw and was inspired by the David Bowie song Warsaza from the Low album. The band played their first gig on May 29, 1977, opening up for the Buzzcocks, Penetration and John Cooper Clark. They would soon find themselves at the Penin Sound Studio in Oldham to record a five song demo. While many of the songs have a punchy punk rock quality, the throbbing bass, the use of harmonics, and the dark bar- baritone moans of Curtis hinted at something quite different from the conventional three chord simplicity. Soon Brother Dale was out as drummer and Steve Morris was brought in. And another problem had to be solved. There was a band called Warsaw Pact in London, so the band changed them, named themselves Joy Division. This name was controversial because the idea was taken from the 1955 novella House of Dolls by K. Zetnik 135633, the pen name of Holocaust survival Yanil Dinur. In the novella, groups of female concentration camp inmates are selected for Joy Divisions, where their purpose was to provide sexual favors for the Nazi soldiers. They would end up back in the studio and record 11 songs for RCA, but did not want to release it because they did not like what the sound engineer did and nor the conditions of their contract with RCA. They took on Rob Gretton as a manager and he managed to get them out of the RCA contract. The band would go on to release the four song EP, An Ideal for Living. For the cover, Bernard Sumner, now calling himself Bernard Altbrick, drew a picture of a Hitler youth playing the drums, which had garnered more controversy. The band fiercely denied they had any connections with fascism or Nazism. One of the highlights is the track No Love Lost. The droning bass, the use of jagged guitars with harmonics, and Curtis's sad existential lyrics created a template plate that would be heard on indie rock albums in the early 90s. 
The band would end up on Granada TV program, So It Goes, on September 20th, 1978. They played one of their new songs, Shadow Play. The band's live performance was mixed with footage of motorway traffic. The band all had short hair and wore dress shirts, a kind of antithesis of punk. But the power of this unique music made punk look tame by comparison. What the audience was witnessing was a completely new form of rock music that invoked the imagery of a post-industrial Manchester. During the performance, Curtis would wave back and forth like a restrained Iggy Pop. The band was introduced by Tony Wilson, who soon became a big supporter of the band. He signed them to the record label that he had formed, Factory Records. They recorded two songs for the Factory sampler, Digital and Glass. With strong support from Wilson, they headed to Strawberry Studios in Stockport, Greater Manchester over three weekends between April 1st to April 17th, 1979. The result was their masterpiece, Unknown Pleasures. The sound created on this album had just as much to do with the players as with the producer, Martin Harnett. The production sounds like the band is playing in an empty room and each instrument is given its own emphasis. The entire album has a dark apocalyptic sound. The drums have a sparseness, the bass has a thick plotting sound, the guitars play sinister yet melodic lines, and Curtis uses his low voice to express the, his angst that ends up cutting through the heart of the listener. Harnett, very much influenced by the dub producers out of Jamaica, added synthesizers, various sounds, and electronic drums. The band did not like this at first, but the end product showed how these additional effects enhanced the sound of the players. The electronic drums on She's Lost Control created a kind of futuristic off-time funk. The lyrics are about a woman that Curtis knew from working at, in the civil service who had severe epilepsy and struggled to find a job. Ironically, Curtis was now struggling with the same condition. The opening track Disorder starts with throbbing bass before the listener is thrown into the upbeat yet bleak soundtrack of the band. Day of the Lords is a drawn-out epic where Curtis's vocals are enhanced by prolonged synthesizer notes. New Dawn Fades has a guitar riff that sounds like a subdued Black Sabbath. The upbeat inner zone has Curtis's voice double tracked, so he's almost doing a call and response with himself. This song would later be covered by alternative metal band Warrior Soul. The very bleak closing track, I Remember Nothing, has Curtis singing sustained notes over the slow temple of the band, again enhanced by the synthesizer and drum effects. Unknown Pleasures was a game changer of an album. It would be a massive influence on goth rock, industrial music, and indie rock in the decades to come. The band would go on tour opening for the Budcocks, and a good chunk of the audience would leave after Joy Division as they felt nothing could follow the power of that performance. Audiences were showing up in particular to witness the powerful band with its enigmatic frontman. But Curtis's life had become complex. He had gotten married at age 19 to Deborah Woodruff in 1975, and in April 1979, they welcomed their first child, Natalie. He now had the pressure to breathe her Friday. In late 1978, he experienced his first epileptic fit. The condition would soon affect live performances, and he would go into fits on stage, sometimes brought on by the throbbing lights, it became hard to determine whether Curtis's dancing was by choice or because of his epilepsy. He was prescribed barbiturates, which ex exacerbated his depressive moods. Due to his condition, he was unable to hold his baby girl Natalie often because of fears of her safety. To further complicate matters, Curtis began having an affair with Belgian journalist, journalist Annick Henri. He also started to become distant from the other band members. The band went on tour in Europe, and the lack of sleep made his epilepsy unbearable. In March 1980, the band went into the studios again to record their second album, Closer. The album had a very dark tone, but made even greater use of synthesizers and effect. The opening track, The Atrocity Exhibition, was taken from the experimental writer's J.G. Baller's fragmented novel of the same name, and the music on the album felt like the chaotic yet clinical landscapes found in Ballard's novels. Curtis's vocals reflect the overwhelming issues that were pulling his life apart. Even though he was very controlling of his wife and did not want her socializing with other men, his affair with Henri continued. Curtis felt overwhelming guilt and things kept spiraling out of control. 
On April 7, 1980, Curtis overdosed on phenobarbitone and was unable to play the scheduled gig the next day, so the vocals were handled by the singers from Crispy Ambulance and A Certain Ratio. His wife Deborah began divorce proceedings, and his health and depression were getting worse and worse. Many gigs had to be cancelled, but he did make the gig on May 2, 1980, which would end up being their last. They were scheduled to begin a U.S.-Canada tour. After trying to convince Deborah to drop the divorce proceedings, he stayed in the house they shared alone on May 17, 1980. He watched the Warner Herzog film Strozek about a busker who travels to the United States and experiences the dark side of the American dream. He also listened to the Iggy Pop album, The Idiot, a title Pop took from a Dostoevsky novel about a prince who struggles with epilepsy. On the morning of May 18, 1980, Curtis hanged himself from the kitchen washing line. In June 1980, the single Love Will Tear Us Apart was released and was massively successful. Several compilation albums of Joy Division singles would be released over the years. The remaining members of the band would continue under the name New Order and would eventually reach greater success than Joy Division. The New Order song Blue Monday was about how the rest of the band were impacted by Curtis's suicide. Joy Division's music would influence numerous bands, and, inf and that influence continues to this day. The iconic cover for Unknown Pleasure, has been designed by Peter Saville, has become a design that can be seen on clothing brands all over the world. Joy Division was a monumental band that had an incredible impact on rock history. Thank you for listening to Exhumed. Next episode, I'm going to analyze more British post-punk bands. Thank you. I'm James Wallace.